Hi everyone, I'm Lisa and I'm one of the fourth year medics and today I'll be giving a revision lecture on the general principles of cellular metabolism. So as well as covering the general principles, I'm also going to talk about the TCA cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, the cellular organisation of metabolism, nutrition and clinical biochemical measurements. So just starting with some very general principles, so the kinds of things you'd include in the start of an essay, maybe in the introduction. Um, so all animals get their energy from food. And the main problem that the body needs to overcome is that there's a continuous demand for energy, but feeding is intermittent. So we need storage molecules that are going to store that energy until we need it. Um, so those storage molecules are fat, glycogen and protein. And when we need energy, we can break those down into fatty acids, glucose and amino acids. And those can be metabolized to produce ATP or the universal energy currency. So why do we need ATP? Well, it would be impractical to link every single energy requiring process directly to an energy generating reaction. And so ATP provides this very short term store of energy that can be used for any energy requiring process. OK, and because we always want supply to meet, de um, yeah, supply to meet demand, um, we need to have lots of control mechanisms for metabolic processes. And those can be divided into short term and long term controls. So short term controls are allosteric effects, which act on the scale of milliseconds. We have covalent modification like phosphorylation, for example, and that acts on the scale of seconds to minutes. And then in terms of long term control, you can change the expression levels of different enzymes. And because enzymes are proteins and they need to be translated, then transcribed um, or the other way around, even that takes hours to days to actually take place. have cycles between organs, for example, the Cori cycle. And that's this cycle where you have glycogen in the liver being broken down to glucose. And then glucose gets pumped to the muscle where it's needed and it undergoes glyco glycolysis to produce pyruvate. Ooh. Sorry, I think I need to let someone into the meeting. Ooh. Cool. So um, we're just talking about the Cori cycle, um, glucose undergoes glycolysis in the muscle and then anaerobic respiration converts that to lactate and your lactate goes back to the liver where it's converted back to pyruvate, then back to glucose and your cycle goes round and round. So in these cycles between organs, not only do you have short term and long term controls happening within the cell, you also can control the rate of delivery of substrates to different cells. So, for example, when you're exercising, um, your heart's going to be beating faster and that's going to increase the rate of delivery of glucose to the muscle. Um, as well as that, you can also control the density of membrane transporters in the cell membrane. Um, so during exercise, muscle contraction actually stimulates the translocation of GLUT4 into the muscle cell membrane. Um, and if you remember GLUT4 is that uh, glucose channel, so that's going to also increase the rate of glucose delivery to the cell. Okay. So let's talk a bit about ATP. Um, you probably know ATP is basically an adenosine with three phosphates on the end. And each time you remove a phosphate, you go from ATP to ADP and then to AMP. And in cells, you want there to be lots of ATP and not much ADP or AMP. And that's because the highest energy bond is the bond that holds the last phosphate onto ATP. So each time you take a bond, a take a bond and break it, that's releasing less and less energy. So you want lots of ATP. And in most cells, you have much more ATP than ADP and much more ADP than AMP. And that kind of ratio is maintained by this enzyme adenylate kinase. And that can just transfer phosphate between these three molecules. Um, if you're in a state of high ATP consumption, however, uh, adenylate kinase can't really keep up. So you get a rise in ADP and AMP. 
and these signal you to increase um, different processes to generate energy and it's important to kind of remember that ADP and AMP are two distinct signals they don't do the same thing so a rise in ADP is a signal to the mitochondria to increase oxidative phosphorylation whereas a rise in AMP is a signal to the cytoplasm to increase glycolysis and if you remember these two things then it makes it much easier later down the line when you're trying to learn what inhibits what enzyme in which pathway and we'll get onto that later okay Ooh. pathways um so here's a simplified version of the tca cycle and the tca cycle or the krebs cycle is what happens to your acetal coa after glycolysis or fatty acid beta oxidation or amino acid metabolism um, and the thing to remember here is that when it's coming from glycolysis, you also need this link reaction carried out by pyruvate dehydrogenase or PDH, um, and that converts pyruvate to acetal-CoA. And in the TCA cycle, as you're going around, um, the things you need to know are that you're getting out three NADH pluses, one FADH2, one GTP by substrate level phosphorylation, and two CO2s from <clears throat> oxidative decarboxylation. And for completeness, water also goes in there. And I'd really recommend learning this cycle, as horrible as that seems. Um, like, it's just good to put it in an essay. Um, OK, so um, we'll cover this later on as well. But one NADH generates 2.5 ATPs one FADH2 generates 1.5 ATPs and so for each cycle of the TCA cycle or for each acetal-CoA that's oxidized you're getting 10 ATPs. Okay. And one of the advantages of having a cycle rather than a linear reaction is that you only need very small amounts of intermediates to oxidize lots of acetal-CoA. We spoke about as well how um, the TCA cycle is linked not just to glycolysis, but also fatty acid oxidation and amino acid metabolism. And if you're ever writing an essay on this, I think where people go wrong is that they only talk about those three things and how they feed into acetal-CoA. But it's important to also remember that you have these catapleurotic reactions. Catapleurotic reactions. Um, and what that means is that these intermediates can be used for other purposes other than the TCA cycle. So, for example, oxaloacetate is used in gluconeogenesis and the synthesis of pyrimidines. Citrates used in fatty acid synthesis. Um, alpha ketoglutarate is used to make glutamine. And succinyl-CoA is used to make porphyrins and heme, which are both components of hemoglobin. And you also have anapleurotic reactions, which um, kind of replenish the intermediates after you've taken them away. Because if you remember, we said that you have very small amounts of intermediates. So you've got to have these anapleurotic reactions to balance out the catapleurotic ones. So the anapleurotic metabolism feeds into the TCA cycle. Instead of feeding in via acetal-CoA, it feeds in via these intermediates. So um, aspartate and asparagine feed in via oxaloacetate. Uh, glycine, wait, no, sorry, glutamine, histidine, arginine, and proline get converted to glutamate first, and then that gets converted to alpha ketoglutarate. And then methionine, isoleucine, valine, and threonine, as well as odd chain fatty acids feed in via succinyl CoA. And then phenylalanine and tyrosine feed in via fumarate. Um, so it's good to remember those or just remember a few examples if you're going to write an essay on this. OK, so regulation of the TCA cycle. Um, the TCA cycle has three key points of regulation. One is uh, PDH, which is technically the link reaction, but I definitely mention it if I was writing about regulation of the TCA cycle. And then the two actual enzymes that get regulated in the cycle are isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. 
And the key thing to remember is that the TCA cycle is regulated by energy demand and not substrate availability. And that makes sense because it doesn't matter how much pyruvate you have going into it. If you don't actually need ATP, then you don't want your cycle to be going round and round. Okay. Um, and it's also helpful to remember that because it means that the TCA cycle is more regulated by things like ATP and NADH than it is by pyruvate. So PDH. PDH is probably the enzyme with the most complex regulatory mechanisms. Um, so it can be directly inhibited by acetyl-CoA, which is its uh, product, and it can also be inhibited by NADH. And what's not shown on the diagram is that in the link reaction, you produce CO2 and NADH. So PDH is essentially inhibited directly by both of its products. And then you can also regulate PDH indirectly via these two enzymes, PDH kinase and calcium activated phosphoprotein phosphatase. And PDH kinase phosphorylates it. And then the phosphoprotein phosphatase does the opposite. So it takes the phosphate off and that activates it. So the things that activate PDH kinase and therefore inactivate PDH are pretty much the same as the things that directly inactivate PDH. But the extra one that you need to remember is ATP. And then things that inhibit PDH kinase are pyruvate, CoASH and NAD. And if you inhibit PDH kinase, then it can't phosphorylate PDH. So PDH is active. Um, with the calcium activated phosphoprotein phosphatase, like the name suggests, it's activated by calcium. And in fact, all three of these enzy enzymes are um, activated by calcium. But um, so calcium levels can rise for a number of reasons. can also rise during muscle contraction because remember calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum during muscle contraction. Um, so that's why it's activated by calcium. Okay, so isocitrate dehydrogenase. Um, that's activated by ADP and calcium. And the way you can remember that it's ADP and not AMP is by remembering that rule from earlier on where ADP is a signal to the mitochondria to increase oxidative phosphorylation. And, um, and it's inhibited by ATP and NADH, which are just signs of energy excess. And similarly, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is also inhibited by ATP and NADH. It's also inhibited by succinyl-CoA, which is its end product. Um, and it's activated by calcium. But like I say, all three of these are activated by calcium. Great. So after you've gone through the TCA cycle, you move on to the electron transport chain. And this is the kind of simplified diagram that I would usually draw in an exam. And just a few things to note about this diagram. Um, so complex two doesn't span the whole membrane and that's related to its function. So you'll notice that complex one pumps out 4H plus, there's 4H plus pumped out at complex three and then 2H plus pumped out at complex four, but complex two doesn't pump any H plus. And that's because it can't because it's not spanning the whole membrane. And something else to note is that NADH enters via complex one and FADH2 enters via complex two. Um, and then the red arrows represent electron movement. So in an exam, you can't really use red pen, but um, that's just what it means in this diagram. Okay, so let's go through what each complex does. Um, complex one. At complex one, you have two electrons being passed from NADH to flavin mononucleotide or FMN. And then that gets passed to iron sulfur clusters. And then that passes the electrons onto ubiquinone. And ubiquinone is also called coenzyme Q, which is why it's a Q on this diagram. And if you have mutations in complex one, you get Lee syndrome. Um, and that's characterized by muscle weakness and muscle spasms. And it's quite a severe disease. So people tend to die of respiratory failure at two to three years old. 
Um, so that just shows how important it is to have a properly functioning electron transport chain. Um, complex two does something very similar. Um, it's physically linked to succinate dehydrogenase, which is that rate, and it has FADH2 as a prosthetic group. Um, and what that means is the FAD is physically linked to complex two. And that's in contrast to NADH, which is a coenzyme, so it can diffuse to a complex one. Um, so NAD coenzyme, FAD prosthetic group. And at complex two, FADH2 passes two electrons directly onto iron sulfur clusters, so you don't need FMN here. And then the electrons pass to ubiquinone. And ubiquinone delivers all those electrons to complex three. So at complex three, the electrons go to cytochrome C, BL, and BH. And then complex three has um, a special name for its iron sulfur cluster, and it's called the RISC protein. And so the electrons go through that and then go on to cytochrome C, which then delivers the electrons to complex four. And at complex four, you get two electrons from two cytochrome C molecules. Um, and then those electrons pass through a heme copper sandwich and then get used to make water. So some of the key things to remember about this diagram, because there's quite a lot of information here, is that because NADH enters at complex one, you get 10 H plus being pumped out. And then because FADH2 enters at complex two, you only get six H plus. Um, some other important things to remember, NADH is the coenzyme, FAD is the prosthetic group, and also complexes one, two, and three have iron sulfur clusters, but complex four has a heme copper sandwich. So I think those are some of the things that I used to forget quite a lot. Okay, right, so we're using this NADH in the matrix, and that NADH has come from the TCA cycle which is taking place in the matrix, so that's fine. But we know that NADH also comes from glycolysis, and that's happening in the cytoplasm. So how do we get that NADH from the cytoplasm into the matrix? Well, the answer is it uses the malate aspartate shuttle. Um, and in this diagram, I haven't included the outer mitochondrial membrane because it's pretty much permeable to everything. Um, but if you do reproduce this diagram, just remember to say that that's why you've left it out. So we've got NADH in the cytoplasm, and it's used by malate dehydrogenase to convert oxaloacetate to malate. And malate crosses the inner mitochondrial membrane into the matrix. And you also have malate dehydrogenase inside the matrix, so it catalyzes the reverse reaction. And so that's how NADH effectively crosses the membrane without actually crossing the membrane. And then, so you're left with oxaloacetate inside the matrix, and that has to be converted to aspartate, and aspartate leaves the matrix and then gets converted back to oxaloacetate. So this is kind of a cycle, and you can... Um, And moving on to the chemiosmotic theory. So the chemiosmotic theory was proposed by Mitchell in 1961, and it basically states that the electron transport chain pumps hydrogen ions out into the intermembrane space, and that generates an H plus gradient. And due to that H plus gradient, there's a protomotive force. And the protomotive force gets used by ATP synthase to produce ATP. So let's talk about ATP synthase. ATP synthase has two subunits. The F0 subunit is an H plus channel, and the F1 subunit is the actual catalytic core. And hydrogen ions flow down their concentration gradient from the intermembrane space into the matrix through F0. And as that happens, that causes the gamma subunit of F1 to rotate. And because of that, there's a conformational change in the protein and ATP synthase interchanges between its tight, loose, and ATP release states. And that's what allows it to phosphorylate ADP, 
and then release its ATP and then pick up another ADP to phosphorylate. And you've probably learned that three H pluses are needed for one ATP to be made. I've put that in inverted commas because I think it's a bit misleading and we'll talk about why that is in a second. So one of the key concepts that you need to talk about if you're ever asked about this as an essay is that electron transport is coupled to ATP production. And what I used to get confused about a lot was I thought that that meant electron transport is what fuels ATP production. So you can't produce ATP without electron transport. But when those two things are coupled, it also means the reverse. So electron transport is dependent on ATP production, which means that if you're not phosphorylating ADP, then electrons aren't going to be drawn through the electron transport chain. And that's given a name called respiratory control. And so you can say that the concentration of ADP exercises respiratory control on electron transport. And then something else that you should know is that the proton gradient is used to transport other things as well. So um, when you're making ATP, you need ADP to be transported into the, into the mitochondria and then ATP to be transported out. And that's done by adenine nucleotide translocase. And this transporter uses the electrical gradient created by the proton gradient um, to do this transport because ATP has a four minus charge and ADP has a three minus charge. So each time it brings in one ADP and pumps out one ATP, it's moving a one minus charge outside across the membrane. Um, and so that's why it's dependent on the electrical gradient. Um, and another thing that you need for ATP production is phosphate. And that's brought into the matrix using the phosphate carrier. And that does it through H plus symport. So for every phosphate that's moved in, one H plus also moves in. Um, and that dissipates the proton gradient. And so this is why 3H plus to one ATP is kind of misleading because for each ATP to be produced, you actually need four H pluses because you need to bring in a phosphate as well. And they sometimes talk about the membrane being leaky. So everything adds up and it's never 3H plus to one ATP. Okay. In terms of evidence for the chemiosmotic theory, um, the evidence is that things that collapse the protomotive force inhibit ATP production. And the two good examples to know are thermogenin and 2,4-dinitrophenol. And thermogenin is an H plus channel that's found in brown fat in babies. And because it's an H plus channel, it lets you dissipate the gradient. And so it's kind of getting rid of that H plus gradient independently of ATP synthase. And that leads to futile cycling and the generation of heat instead of ATP. And the reason that this is found in babies is that babies have a larger surface area to volume ratio. And so they're more at risk of hypothermia. Um, they also can't shiver, but that could be the cause or the result of having brown fat. So they might not need to shiver if they have brown fat. OK, um, and the other example is 2,4-DNP. And 2,4-DNP is a lipophilic weak acid. And because it's lipophilic, it can cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. And because it's an acid, it's a proton donor, so it can dissipate the proton gradient. And that again leads to futile cycling and the generation of heat instead of ATP. And because of this, it was used as an illegal weight loss supplement. Um, but it caused a very high mortality rate, so that's why it was illegal. Okay, moving on to the cellular organization of metabolism. So we've Really key site of metabolism. They're the site of the TCA cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, and beta oxidation of fatty acids. And mitochondria weren't always part of eukaryotic cells. Um, there's the theory of endosymbiosis, which states that mitochondria used to just be independent cells that were really good at aerobic respiration. 
and one day they were just engulfed by another cell and that's how they became incorporated into eukaryotic cells. And the theory of endosymbiosis explains why mitochondria have their own genome. And in the mitochondrial genome, there are 13 encoded proteins, including some components of the electron transport chain. And mitochondria also have their own protein synthesizing machinery, including their own distinct ribosomes and 22 unique tRNAs. In addition, they can also be biosynthesized independently of the cell. So for example, in active muscles like cardiomyocytes or in states of hypoxia, you can biosynthesize more mitochondria to compensate for that. Um, you can also get mitochondrial diseases. And these have a maternal inheritance because during fertilization, all the mitochondria come from the ovum and none of it comes from the sperm. There's also huge variation in severity. That's because when cells undergo mitosis and meiosis, the mitochondria are distributed randomly between the daughter cells. So you can imagine how if you're forming gametes, then one gamete might have a high proportion of mutant mitochondria and another might not have any mutant mitochondria. So that's why there's so much variation. And a good example to know is Leber hereditary optic neuropathy, which is characterized by adult onset blindness and heart disorders. And that's quite characteristic of mitochondrial diseases to affect the um, nervous system and the heart more than other tissues, because um, those tissues are generally quite metabolically active. And so they're more dependent on their mitochondria for function. OK, the endoplasmic reticulum. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in a lot of different things. It contains cytochrome P450, which is involved in detoxification and steroid production. It's also the site of fatty acid synthesis, um, as it's where fatty acid chains over 16 carbons long get elongated. And it's also the site of the final step of gluconeogenesis. So it's really important in the liver and in the renal cortex. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on its surface. That's why it's rough. And those ribosomes carry out translation. Um, translated. If they're being modified on the inside of the lumen at the same time, then that's co-translational modification. But they can also be modified once they've left the ribosome as well. And that's post-translational modification. So that happens in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The Golgi apparatus. Um, also modifies proteins. So, for example, mucins. Um, mucins get glycosylated there as they get transported through the Golgi apparatus. Um, they're also the site of protein sorting for trafficking. Um, I was always confused about what that meant, but what it means is, so after you've translated your proteins in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they get transported to the Golgi apparatus in these vesicles, uh, which fuse with the cis Golgi network and then they move through the Golgi apparatus towards the trans Golgi network and as they do that they get modified but if you imagine that all these different proteins are arriving at the cis Golgi network um, these proteins could be destined for the cell surface or for lysosomes and so as they get transported through the Golgi apparatus they get sorted depending on where they're going to go next and that means that when eventually um, little vesicles bud off from the Golgi apparatus, um, each vesicle only contains proteins destined for a specific compartment. So it's just more efficient in that way. Um, so the Golgi apparatus, as well as the endoplasmic reticulum, actually um, make new lipid membrane for incorporation into the plasma membrane or for other organelles. Okay, lysosomes. Uh, lysosomes contain hydrolases, and they're basically just sacs of these hydrolytic enzymes. And hydrolases have an acidic optimum pH, so lysosomes are generally around pH 5 on the inside. Um, the hydrolases can break down lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. They have lots of different hydrolases inside. Um, if you're breaking down a foreign particle, for example, after engulfing a bacterium, 
then that bacterium gets um, phagocytosed toast into an endosome and the endosome fuses with the lysosome to form an endolysosome and that's how the hydrolases get exposed to the foreign particles but they can also um, break down intracellular components for example old protein um, and once you've broken those things down the breakdown products are released into the cytoplasm to be used for other things but sometimes you have things that can't be digested and those are residual bodies and those just get exocytosed again. Normally you want lysosomes to stay intact because you don't want hydrolases to go and digest healthy parts of the cell. Um, contents and that's how the cell auto digests and this can also happen in pathology so in gout you can phagocytose uric acid crystals instead of being broken down because they're quite sharp they can actually disrupt the lysosomal membrane and that leads to the release of hydrolases um, you can also get lysosomal storage diseases and these are where one of the enzymes one of the hydrolases is missing um, and because that enzyme is missing, you get a buildup of the substrate for that specific enzyme. And so the lysosomes expand and expand until they start to disrupt cellular function. And one of the more severe lysosomal storage diseases is Wolman's disease, which is a complete absence of lysosomal acid lipase. And it's usually fatal by age one. Peroxisomes. So peroxisomes are quite similar to lysosomes um, in that they contain enzymes that break things down, metabolize things. But the difference is that the enzymes in peroxisomes use hydrogen peroxide um, instead of water like the hydrolases do. And once that hydrogen peroxide has been used, it's broken down by catalase into oxygen and water. And because you're producing and breaking down hydrogen peroxide in the same organelle, there's a low risk of damage to the rest of the cell. Um, as well as kind of using perox peroxides to break things down, peroxisomes are also the site of oxidation of very long fatty acids. Um, and also the site of synthesis of bile acids, plasmalogens, which are specific phospho phospholipids in the cell membrane and glycerolipids which are basically glycerol with at least one fatty acid attached um, and you can get peroxisome biogenesis disorders for example Zellweger syndrome and that's caused by mutations in peroxins which are proteins that are involved in peroxisome assembly and so because you have dysfunctional peroxisomes you get high levels of very long chain fatty acids and bile precursors and you have low levels of plasmalogens and Zellweger syndrome is usually fatal by six months of age. Okay. So in peroxisomes um, we said how hydrogen peroxide is produced and destroyed in the same organelle but you can also get reactive oxygen species being generated at the electron transport chain in mitochondria and so for those to be broken down the cell needs different mechanisms to do that so hydrogen peroxide or peroxides in general are thion is mostly present in its reduced state so that means that there's a very high chance of it bumping into something and being able to reduce it um, so it reduces peroxides to alcohols using glutathione peroxidase and then once it's been uh, once it reduces the peroxide it itself is oxidized so it needs to then be converted back to its reduced form and that's carried out by this enzyme glutathione reductase so you have these two enzymes glutathione peroxidase and glutathione reductase working together to maintain this kind of 500 reduced glutathione to one oxidized glutathione ratio. And superoxides are dealt with by superoxide dismutase. And superoxide dismutase converts superoxide into hydrogen peroxide. And then catalase then converts the hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. And you also have um, vitamin. In which the oxidants, I think there are 
lots of different antioxidant molecules as well, but these are the ones that are on the spec. Okay, so let's talk briefly about nutrition. So in terms of nutrition, you need to know that there are macronutrients and micronutrients. And the macronutrients are fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And you need to know that there are essential nutrients. So essential fatty acids like omega-3, and you have nine essential amino acids. And these things are essential because your body doesn't have the enzymes to produce them. So it's really important that you take them in through your diet. Um, so omega-3, for example, is found in oily fish. And then you need to know that there are different types of dietary carbohydrate. And depending on the type, that changes how much it raises your blood glucose. So non-glycemic carbohydrates are the ones where we don't have the enzymes to break them down. So for example, we can't break down cellulose, pectin or resistant starch. So those are the things that we generally call fiber in our diet. And because we can't break them down, they don't raise our blood glucose levels. On the other hand, you have glycemic carbohydrates, which do raise blood glucose levels because you can break them down. So that's all the different sugars and starch. And different carbohydrates can raise your blood glu glucose by a different amount. And so it's useful to have this index called the glycemic index, which is a measure of how much a carbohydrate raises blood sugar levels. Okay. So in terms of micronutrients, um, those are the vitamins and minerals. And you have um, lots of different minerals, but there are only three on the spec that you need to know about. So, system. And so if you have zinc deficiency, you have stunted growth and poor immune function. And then copper is involved in cross-linking of collagen, red blood cell production, immune system function, and loads of other different things. But you should probably remember cross-linking of collagen because that relates to some of the symptoms of the diseases. And the two diseases related to copper that you need to know about are Menke's disease and Wilson's disease. So Menke's disease is a mutation in ATP7A. And this is the protein that once, you're, once you've absorbed copper from your diet into your enterocytes, um, ATP7A is the gene that encodes the protein that transports copper from the enterocytes into the blood. And so if that transport is not working properly, then you get a buildup of copper in the intestines, but no copper in the places that you actually need it. So no copper in the brain or low copper, even in the brain, skin, hair, bones. And if you remember, copper is involved in the cross-linking of collagen, so you get brittle hair. Um, and the in children, there's three things that characterise Menke's disease typically, and that's brittle hair, failure to thrive, and hypotonia. Um, and hypotonia, in case you don't know, is just where your muscles have reduced tone, so you're kind of limp and floppy. And Wilson's disease, Wilson's disease is basically the opposite, but it's a mutation in ATP7B. And ATP7B encodes the transporter that usually transports excess copper into the bile for excretion with the feces. And people often talk about case of Fleischer rings, but um, I don't know if you need to know this for first year, but you, you normally actually need a slit lamp to see case of Fleischer rings. disease is quite progressed um, but it also affects the liver so you get jaundice and ascites and it affects the brain so you get tremors muscle stiffness psychosis as well as lots of other neurological symptoms and then interestingly on your spec um, it doesn't mention any of the diseases associated with iron I feel like that's one of the things that they would just put an MCQ on anyway so I'm going to discuss them quickly. But iron's involved in hemoglobin production. And so if you have a deficiency in iron, you get iron deficiency anemia. Makes sense. Um, you can also have a hereditary condition called hemochromatosis, where you have iron overload in your tissues. And all the iron just builds up in your different organs. So for example, in the liver, that leads to liver cirrhosis. You also get um, iron overload just non-hereditary iron overload. And that happens in people who get 
also blood transfusions. Okay, and then the vitamins. So just checking the time. Okay, um, let's go through these quickly. Again, the syllabus only has the B vitamins for some reason, but I assume that you cover the other vitamins in other parts of the spec. So, um, thiamine, its derivatives are involved in neuronal transport, and the two diseases that people generally talk about are beriberi and Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. So, in beriberi, there are different subtypes that affect different systems. So dry beriberi primarily affects the peripheral nervous system and wet beriberi affects the cardiovascular system. And Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, um, that's associated with this vision changes, ataxia and impaired memory. And it's typically seen in alcoholics and that's because alcohol causes inflammation of the stomach lining. And so it's reducing the ability to absorb different vitamins. Um, riboflavin or vitamin B2 is used to make FAD. So if you have a deficiency, that's called ariboflavinosis, and that leads to stomatitis, stomatitis, which is inflammation in your mouth and skin rashes. And then niacin is vitamin B3, and it's used to make NAD and NADP. And a deficiency in niacin can lead to pellagra. So you get dry skin and mouth lesions and anemia. And pyridoxine or vitamin B6 is used in amino acid, carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. And it's also used in hemoglobin production and a deficiency causes skin lesions, conjunctivitis, neuropathy and anemia. Folic acid or vitamin B9, it's very rarely called vitamin B9, but folic acid is used to make nucleic acids. And um, so it's really important in cells that are actively dividing. Um, and a tube defect. So if the mother's deficient in folate, then the baby might have neural tube defects. Then you have cobalamin or vitamin B12. It's normally called vitamin B12 rather than cobalamin. And that's involved in myelin synthesis and red blood cell maturation. And again, you get neurological abnormalities and anemia. And then I just, just want to quickly expa explain antifolate drugs because this is something that I found quite confusing. But antifolate drugs can be used as cancer drugs and as antibiotics. And when they're used as cancer drugs, they're typically folate analogues. So, for example, methotrexate is a folate analogue. Um, and because folates required in um, rapidly dividing cells, those cells are the ones that are selectively targeted by antifolates. Um, but because you also have normal non-cancerous rapidly dividing cells, for example, the ones in your hair follicles, um, that's why you get side effects like hair loss. Um, and then you can also use antifolate drugs as antibiotics. So those are the sulfonamides, for example. Um, and when they're used as antibiotics, that relies on a different principle. So bacteria have their own enzymes to produce folic acid, whereas we need to take it in through our diet. And so um, these antifolates, when they're used as antibiotics, are selectively target those enzymes that are synthesizing folic acid. And so um, antifolate drugs are doing different things depending on what they're used for. Okay. And then a final word on clinical biochemical measurements. You don't need to know much about this. But in a clinical setting, you might order some biochemical tests. And those include um, blood, blood gases, different electrolytes, pH, metabolic substrates, hormones and enzymes. Um, and enzymes are especially useful because they can be used to assess tissue damage. So there are these liver enzymes, um, alanine aminotransferase and so aspartate aminotransferase. Um, and those liver enzymes can be released when there's liver damage. And similarly, um, if someone's presenting with sensual crushing chest pain, you think they might be having a heart attack. The test that you order is a troponin test because troponins, um, troponin levels will be, be higher if they are having a heart. Um, and enzyme measurements are also 
useful for detecting enzyme deficiencies. So we've spoken a lot about different enzyme deficiencies today, but pyruvate kinase deficiency is one that you should probably know about as well. And pyruvate kinase is that enzyme that's involved in the last step of glycolysis. Um, and that causes hemolytic anemia because red blood cells don't have any mitochondria, so they're completely dependent on glycolysis for energy production. Particularly important molecules. So the hexokinase test is the one that you need to know about. And what happens is hexokinase acts on glucose to generate G6P or glucose 6-phosphate, and that's then acted on by another enzyme, G6P dehydrogenase, which generates NADH. And you can measure NADH in a spectro spectrophotometer. And so it's kind of like an indirect measure of how much um, glucose there was in the first place. But the reason enzymes are so good for measuring these biological molecules is that they're specific because of the lock and key mechanism. They're specific to what they're looking for. So that's an advantage of having enzymes. Great. And then I've added some multiple choice questions, um, which we can go through if you want. Um, or we can finish early. Let's just go through them. Um, Oh, great, sorry, this is being recorded. Let's not go through them. But these will be in the at the end of the feedback form and they'll have the answers as well at the end of the feedback form. Um, so that's where you can find those and have a practice. Great, thank you very much.